Hey, how you doing? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books and covering Kevin Feige, Marvel, and Disney quite a bit these last few months in particular. I want to tell you about this. There's a recent article that covered another aspect of this podcast, which was a very recent interview with Kevin Feige about his secrets of Marvel Studios and their incredible success, but also like how they operate in some of the stuff that's not quite as successful recently. Uh, we did this video talking about the secret formula that Kevin Feige says he has for developing Marvel content and creating hits, which basically is, as we found, to just literally, he says these two things. One, you've got to slap the Marvel logo on it. Two, there's got to be a seed of an idea from something in the 80 year history of the comics publishing. Now, that is not very much to go on. It doesn't really tell you that they're focused on continuity. It doesn't tell you really that they're focused on quality. It tells you that they're focused on exploiting the Marvel brand with no limits, with no structure, with no consideration for what the brand is supposed to represent. If you went to McDonald's, you'd expect to get a certain kind of hamburger. If you bought a gift from somebody, a very expensive gift at Tiffany's, you'd expect a certain kind of product. You go to Wendy's, you expect something specifically. So all these brands stand for certain things, not when it comes to Marvel. But this article is interesting. It follows up from the direct about the specific idea of superhero fatigue, which we've all been hearing a lot about. And why do we hear about superhero fatigue? Well, there have been a lot of Marvel projects and it is fair to say, hey, the more you have of something, the less new, the less original it seems like it's gonna be, but that's not really the case over at Marvel. It seems like the fatigue has something to do with them not honoring the original takes on the characters, the original backgrounds and stories, what the characters looked like, what their motivations were, what their histories were. And what people seem to be getting tired of is they just keep pushing their agendas through the characters trying to, it was interesting. I saw an interview, Bob Iger's exit interview from CNBC, a little bit, uh, about an hour long. And, um, you know, when he first stepped down and left the company and he was talking about how one of the major themes was to support the hero's journey. And he was also saying inclusion, which, you know, they came up with this inclusion concept as part of their ideological take on things. That was never part of Disney. That didn't exist at Disney prior to Bob Iger becoming CEO and certainly prior to the big social agenda push that's been coming from mass media lately. So it's odd to, to see that as though that's supposed to be part of what was core of Disney. It really never was. And you can see them trying to force it wherever they try to tell a story. One of the greatest hero's journey stories is Moana. It does a great recent example. She's a female character a great story it is a hero's journey it happens to be a female character doesn't matter it's told correctly the character struggles accomplishes things that's a great character that's a great story nothing fatigueish about that now moana is not part of marvel but moana is part of disney the problem is where are those stories from marvel but let's see how kevin feige himself decided to describe it in this article before we get into the article, please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate you guys. The channel's growing. You guys really are the best. While speaking on a podcast, and this is the podcast, the Movie Business Podcast, I will give you a link to that so you can hear it for yourself. Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige addressed the idea of superhero fatigue among moviegoers. To say superhero media is popular would be an understatement. For those looking to get their fill of heroes, there's plenty of opportunity to do so. After all, 2022 alone saw over a dozen live action superhero stories hit both big screens and televisions worldwide, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Marvel continues to shovel more and more and more content. Marvel Studios has dozens of announced and rumored projects in development, and an end is nowhere in sight. Then there's James Gunn and Peter Safran's upcoming DCU slate, which is supposed to be an announcement on, like literally any day now, which will undoubtedly spawn countless projects under its own banner. Interestingly, the Saffron and Gun projects from the DCU are supposed to be tight continuity with an eight to 10 year plan, which is also supposedly already approved by management. So unlike what Marvel is doing now, it's not just going to have the logo and a seed of an idea. There will be timelines that relate to the characters and they're not just going to have continuity with their films. They're supposed to have continuity as well. They've claimed through their TV shows, through animation, and also through 
video game, but not necessarily through the comic books. This has led many to believe superhero fatigue will only worsen. In fact, a recent study conducted by fandom revealed that over one third of Marvel fans are getting fatigued with the MCU. But what does the head of Marvel Studios have to say about it all? Marvel and superhero fatigue. Maybe it's Kevin Feige fatigue. Let me know what you think of that in the comments below. While guesting on the movie business podcast, Marvel Studios' Kevin Feige talked about how the Hollywood giant navigates creating the MCU's various phases and how he feels regarding superhero fatigue. When asked how Marvel Studios decides on what their phases will be, Feige was quick to point out the 80 plus years of Marvel comic history as their guide. Quote, each of our sagas are broken into phases and we now find ourselves on the precipice of phase two of the multiverse saga. And there are two ways to do it. One, we look at an overarching narrative, always using the comics and the 80 plus years of Marvel comic history as our guide of what general long-term story we want to do. But really it comes down to each individual film or series and what type of genre we want to do. Asked for the question of superhero fatigue, it's something that people were asking since his second year at Marvel. I've been at Marvel Studios for 22 years now, over 22 years, and most of us here at Marvel Studios have been around a decade or longer together. And from probably my second year at Marvel, people were asking, well, how long is this going to last? Is this fad of comic book movies going to end? And I didn't really understand the question because to me, it's akin to saying after Gone with the Wind, how many more movies can be made off of novels? Do you think the audience will sour on movies being adapted from books? Now, of course, you can adapt any kind of comic book to a film, and it's already been done. All kinds of comics have been adapted to all kinds of media, film, video games, TV shows. The question is about if you're going to actually do superhero stories that Marvel is known for, its classic original Marvel universe, how many superhero movies can you actually do? There was a limit to how many comics Marvel could actually do and maintain their quality. The more they did, the lower the quality, the more convoluted the storylines and the less they're able to keep up with the continuity. And then you get the concept of multiverse and having 75 different Spider-Mans. And you know, it does become a mess after a while. And if you actually design it properly, let me know what you think of this, please, in the comments below. It is a little bit more interesting when you have characters that operate in continuity, in storylines, and the timelines actually line up and someone's actually doing the work of telling this overarching larger story. Feige continues his comparison to adapting books, emphasizing that there are 80 years of the most interesting, emotional, groundbreaking stories that have been told in the Marvel comics for their company to explore and bring to life. And then of course, update for inclusion purposes, which I have a problem with because they put that before the story every time they try to say, no, 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 we want to entertain first and then just give other people an opportunity to participate in the stories. It's not what they do, it's just not. Well, you would never ask that because there's an inherent understanding among most people that a book can be anything. A novel can have any type of story whatsoever, so it depends on what story you're translating. We went on to point out that adapting these stories into different genres is also a key to keep the content fresh and avoid fatigue. Doing different genres within superhero movies and maintaining the continuity, that's fine. And that is something that's been done in comics. Doctor Strange is a great example of that. Not every book is the X-Men. You know, every Marvel comic, when it was conceived, had some aspect of uniqueness to it. Thor obviously was unique, and the world that Thor came from was unique. They were all superpower, but they were all flawed, and they were all relatable as people. There's no reason you can't have different genres. But another way to do that is adapting them into different genres and what types of movies we want to make. And I, sitting at USC, probably semester two before you're screening in class, Jason, and sitting in Cinema 101, and being exposed to so many different types of film that I said, I want to make all of these. I don't want to just make one kind of movie. I want to make all kinds of movies. And I found that if we tell the story right and we adapt them in a way that the audience still knock on wood so far is following along with us 22 plus years later with that we can tell any types of movies that share two things, the Marvel Studios logo above the title and a seed of an idea from our publishing history. That is not much of a standard and I get into this in much more detail in this video if you want to check it out. I will link to it. Keeping superhero stories fresh. One thing that makes the superhero genre so unique is how these stories can be set within any other type of narrative milieu that creatives working the magic want. There can be horror, comedy, political thriller, big blockbuster spectacle, it's all possible. The experiences of Captain America, The Winter Soldier, Werewolf by Night, Ant-Man, Avengers Endgame are all vastly different movies despite all being focused on superheroes. That is likely a key reason why these types of movies and shows are still going strong to this day. Seeing as the genre has survived post-Endgame and continues to thrive, even despite some rocky reception here and there, 
is a testament to these stories and characters being brought to life. But I will say is, look, they know they overdid it in terms of overextending what the Marvel brand is supposed to be. I don't know what they're doing to correct it. I haven't seen them talking about correcting it. I have seen Disney make statements that they're gonna create some quality control board because phase four was considered so terrible by fans um, and critics alike. And I, I don't know what the structure of it's gonna be. Uh, if you've got any details that you've heard about it, I'd love to see it in the comments below. But obviously something is very wrong when you release phase four and people say, look, this isn't very good. The reception isn't that good. The budgets to produce Disney Plus shows in particular are absolutely astronomical. Every one is like $25 million an episode compared to Sandman, which is $15 million an episode. So what the heck? Where is all this money going? And then if the money is going that far and they're spending that kind of money, why isn't the quality better? So something is very wrong with what Marvel is doing and what it's been doing. Supposedly they're working on the quality. I, this is why Bob Iger has a huge mess on his hands this is Bob Iger's fault. He let Kevin Feige go completely far off the range, but Iger also made the decision that inclusion was supposed to be some big part of the Disney theme. And ever since they've introduced that, Disney has lost a massive part of its magic and its focus on storytelling, at least as far as I can tell. Again, let me know what you think, please, in the comments below. Please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications, give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you again soon with another video. And if I don't see you, I will miss you.